Well, thank you for being with us this afternoon. Uh, we're very happy, excited to be here. Uh, this is for those physicians who are yet to find a program, uh, a sponsor of the J-1 waiver, and, and graduating this coming summer. Uh, we're going to give you some information, some options that you still have to get your waiver done so you can start working and practicing after residency or fellowship this summer in this 2023. Uh, my name is Angela Lopez. I'm an attorney, immigration attorney with Pauls and Thompson. And with me is my uh, colleague, Michelle Alonso. Good afternoon or good evening. Good evening. Great. So um, we have been doing different presentations. Last year, we did a series of uh, workshops or, or webinars going in detail on waivers, requirements, and other things. So today, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about the definition of a waiver or what is the two-year rule and all these things, but I'm going to give you a quick recap. So just for us to have a, 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 a frame to... Uh, be able to talk about what options are available and what you can do at this time. Uh, waivers. So per um, legal notice, please understand the information here is general in nature, doesn't apply to specific situations. If you have a specific case or situation that you want to talk to us about, please feel free to contact us and we will be happy to talk to you. The home, uh, we, we're going to talk about the two-year home residency, returning back home, the waiver options, H-1B and all ones are always an option for some physicians, not everybody, and questions and answers. During the presentation, if you have any questions, you can type it on your chat. We'll monitor. Hopefully, we're going to be able to answer your questions as we do the presentation, but at the end, we're going to have uh, some time for questions uh, regarding this um, presentation. The two-year residency rule, we know, or, or if not, today you're gonna to learn that after completing residency or fellowship training, J-1 physicians must return home to home country or last place of residence for two years or obtain a waiver. It's either or, there is no, nothing in between. So if obtained a waiver, you can stay in the United States and work in H-1B or adjust the status to green card. Home country means last place of residence in its country of life citizen or permanent residency, uh, even if you have dual citizenship. Uh, for example, and we have some physicians who completed uh, training or they obtained their medical degree in, uh, let me just say, uh, India. And eventually they became citizens of Canada. Well, they'll have to go back home because that would be the place where they obtain the J-1 visa and other things. So it's not necessarily the last place, but mostly where you obtain the visa before coming to the United States. Um, for J-1 physicians who do training in the United States, is sponsored by the Educational Commission for Foreign Medical Graduates, ECFMG, you're all subject to the two-year foreign residency uh, requirement. There's no need to check or ask. We get these questions asked frequently. If you have an ECFMG certificate, you're subject to the two-year foreign residency. No questions asked. It is what it is. Uh, if you decide that, okay, I'm going to return home because I can't find a waiver or I want to go back home for two years because I don't want to work in an underserved area, which is one of the requirements to obtain a waiver for three years, well, then what you need to be aware of is, yes, you can go home for two years. Our advice is you have to keep copy of records of the full two years. It's not uh, one year and... 10 months or nine year, uh, two, one year and almost 12 months. No, it's full 24 months, two years showing you resided in your place of where you're supposed to be completing the two years, last place of residence or home country. Uh, so to that effect, and I have questions that we are asked frequently asked, can I come back to the United States to visit? Of course, you can come and visit on a vacation a week, two weeks, and then go back home. 
living or residing back home doesn't mean you cannot leave your home home country for two years. Of course, if you take vacation, but if the vacation becomes like it is your normal routine for two years, you're traveling around the world and you're not stepping foot in your country, that might not be compliance. Also, if you decide that, okay, I'm gonna visit the United States, but you visit the United States for six months and then you leave for a couple of weeks or a month and then you come back, that's not compliance. The bottom line is residing in your home country. So uh, normally people, when they're residing in a place, they, they work. So they have employment records. You need to keep copy of the stamp showing the first time you enter your, you enter your country. Uh, salary, pay staffs, uh, lease agreements, home, uh, apartment. If you buy a car, furniture, uh, bank account, uh, different things that shows that you did actually live and function as a normal resident of the specific country. Why? Because when you want to return to the United States later on, you will have to um, prove that you did comply with the three, two years so you can obtain other visas or other benefits. So keep those records because you will need them eventually if you want to come back to live, work, or reside in the United States. Um, you are also subject to the two, uh, to the H-1B cap or numerical limitation. Uh, we're not gonna talk much about the numerical limitation today because today is not H-1B cap uh, presentation, but that means that uh, you, will need one or two things to be able to obtain an H-1B visa in the United States. You can get any other visas, you can get green cards, but for H-1B specifically, which is the most common visa for professionals in the United States, is uh, you will have to apply under the H-1B CAT program, which only gives 85,000 visas per year. It requires a registration, and then if your employer is selected for the lottery, then he can apply for the green uh, for the H one B for the individual to start working on October first, and you will be subject to that numerical limitation unless you are lucky enough. And and in in healthcare, you find a lot of employers who are not subject to the two to the H one B cap. A perfect example is a nonprofit teaching hospital, not because it's a teaching hospital. It is because to have a, a, the teaching program, the hospital has to have agreements with institutions of higher education or medical schools. So a nonprofit that has those agreements in place and have a students training at their location then qualifies for exempt means, which means you don't have to worry about filing the H-1B during specific times of the year or the numerical limitation, that employer can sponsor your H-1B visa at any time during the year. And you don't have to worry about that. But if you decide to leave, go home for two years, then you're gonna be subject to the uh, H-1B cap um, numerical limitation. If you decide to stay in the United States, then you have to obtain a waiver. Michelle? So there we have three types of waivers, and these are pretty much what the presentation is about because you want to get in with one of these. One will be the interested government agency, then there's the hardship waiver and the persecution waiver. So those will proceed. All right. So the exceptional hardship. Now, you probably heard about hardship waivers, and you'll hear words like extreme hardship. Um, but this one's talking about exceptional hardship. That must be, and that's where it says unusual and significant. So extreme hardship is one level. Exceptional hardship goes beyond that. And this is not hardship to you, the individual physician. This is hardship to your qualifying relative. So you must have a U.S. citizen or legal permanent resident spouse or child that you'll be using to qualify for this waiver. So some basic considerations. Relocation and separation is just not going to be enough. Uh, they've deemed simple separation. It's just not a significant enough factor to rise to exceptional hardship. So when we talk about these hardship waivers, um, especially with clients, we want to make sure we know exactly what the hardship is, whether it's a medical hardship, something that's documented. We want to be able to show that um, that's the situation. So hardship factors 
will include um, economics. So in some situations, we've had physicians who have uh, either children or a spouse who has a medical condition, and it's just financially not feasible for them to get that kind of treatment abroad or to maintain the treatment plan here if they don't have that position. Um, loss of employment, again, this is more for the spouse. Say your spouse is going to be giving up a potential career that um, they earn a lot of money or they've had a lot of education for that because they can't practice that uh, in the home country for two years. That's a significant um, hardship factor. Um, medical, uh, as I mentioned, medical hardship is, is a big one. Um, we've had some situations where the medical treatment for the qualifying relative is just not available in that home country. So uh, we, we show that that's not available. Um, we had a case not too long ago where they said, show us how there is no treatment in the home country for that particular condition. And we you know, the client worked very hard to get letters from, you know, heads of medical boards out there to show, uh, no, we don't have um, the sophisticated technology to issue this treatment, or we don't have access to the drugs to administer this um, type of treatment that this particular individual needs. Again, your qualifying relative. Um, and political, religious, and social conditions, in, in some situations, those those particular conditions are going to impact your spouse or your children to such a significant degree that you're going to get to that exceptional hardship level. But no cases alike. And, and we always have a very tailored approach because not every case is going to present the same exact factors in or every country for that matter. So um, the advantages, why do you want to get the J1 waiver? Well, if let's assume you're a U.S. citizen spouse. That's who you have. That's an immediate relative. But you have this J-1 uh, two-year home residency requirement. It's just the one thing standing in the way. If we're able to secure the exceptional hardship waiver, you can immediately go and file your immediate relative petition and adjustment status. Again, also, if you have a U.S. employer who's willing to sponsor you and you've gotten to a point where you could file your green card status, but again, you have this impediment, um, with this waiver, that's no longer an issue and you can proceed with adjustment of status. Um, but then you can see there's also disadvantages. So let's say you get the waiver, but you're not going to like one of those H-1B uh, cap exempt institutions that Angela was mentioning, you will be cap subject. So um, you will have to go through the lottery like everyone else if you're not dealing with a cap exempt uh, employer. And look, the fact is, these waivers take a long time. Um, processing times, I think, have been posted for 11 months and 12 months, but we've seen these take well over 18 months. Um, and it, just a caveat, if you look at processing times, there is that notation that says 80% of the cases are completed within this projected window. And I will tell you, we've been in that 20% oftentimes. <laughs> so, um, The next one is persecution. So if there's possible, would you be subject to persecution? So the persecution waiver um, it is one that's very legitimate. Um, it's perse possible, possible persecution regarded um, on account of race, religion, or political opinion. Um, it's codified. But here's where it gets tricky. The Department of State may still, USCIS could say, okay, yes, you've shown us that there's possible prosecution. We have seen the Department of State say on program and policy grounds they're not going to approve. They're not going to authorize that the, the waiver go through. So while you may have a, a possible case for persecution, oftentimes when we go into this uh, area, we'll talk to the candidate about um, looking at an asylum application because asylum, if you can rise the level of possible persecution, you may have another avenue through asylum. Again, we won't cover all the details of that avenue, but just know it's available and there is a pathway that way for a green card where you don't have to worry about the two-year home residency requirement because you'll be adjusting under a separate section of the law. Those are options. And as Michelle explained, then you have all these other options. Okay. So it's good to know that even though it's February and you might be feeling the rush of, I need to get a, a, a sponsor for my waiver because I'll be graduating in June and, and I don't have a waiver yet. Well, you have many options still available. Uh, we start with the Conrad Terry State Program. There are still, and we have a list of some of the states that we were able to confirm before this presentation that they are still open. They still have a, a slats available. Uh, you have the uh, VA waivers, the department 
of Health and Human Services, HHS, the a ARC Appalachian Regional Commission, Delta Regional Authority, and the newest one, the Southeast Crescent Regional Commission, SRCRC. All of these waivers, but Conrad 30, a limited number of waivers, they cover different regions. So if for any reason you don't find a state 30 Conrad, look into any of these other programs because you will find something. The problem is that these programs are limited to certain regions which may not be your first choice, but you still can do your waiver. So let's start with um, J-1 waiver, Conrad State 30 programs. Um, in general, every state, 50 states in the United States, they have 30 slots per fiscal year. Fiscal year goes from October 1st to September 30th, but every state on October 1st, some states start on September, in September to take waivers, they start the new fiscal year with 30 slots that they can give out to physicians that qualify for the waiver. Um, the work location has to be in a health shortage professional area or medical underserved area or a medical underserved population. And we put there the website where you can go and check the address of this place where you might be working. There are flex waivers, and I didn't include it here because they are not as popular. And those are the ones where your employer or the person who's gonna, or the entity that is going to sponsor your waiver, it qualifies on the basis of the population they serve surrounding areas, but the location where you would be practicing itself is not underserved. So that's why they call it flex. Uh, but most most of the waivers we've done uh, in the last couple of years have been all, always uh, not flex. Uh, three year minimum contract, Required, that's a federal government requirement. All of these programs, regardless, you need a contract for three years. And the Congress State 30 programs, they do uh, give preference to primary care, but they also accept subspecialties. And we even have certain programs which are hilarious. Like California, they say, we don't, we don't have anything against primary care physicians, but we will not accept um, petitions from a specialist until July 1st of the following year if we have waivers available. Normally, California runs out of waivers before July. So that tells you most J1 waiver, uh, J1 specialty physicians are not able to get waivers in California. Um, one thing that has helped these uh, state 30 CONRA waivers is that the Department of Health and Human Services, the HHS, they changed the regulations two years ago where they now accept waivers from any employer that is located, that the work location is in a, a HIPSA, health professional shortage areas with a minimum score of seven. So what many of these programs, almost all of them that I have knowledge of, uh, they are now requiring physicians and employers whose waivers qualify for the HHS waiver to go through that route because the state wants to maximize the number of waivers that they can grant. So if they can grant 30 waivers in addition to a, a bunch of other waivers that the HHS can approve for their state, that's how they're gonna do. So it has opened up these Congress State 30 programs for specialties. Um, definitely for the primary care who do not have a HIPSA location with a list of a seven score HIPSA, but mainly um, physicians uh, that have subspecialties. Uh, deadlines, depending on states, some states only take waivers from certain days or certain day and then they close. Uh, others take waivers year round and we still have a few, a few of those. Um, the unused slots do not roll over every fiscal year. They start with 30 slots, period, even if they were not able to fulfill all the 30 slots. Hospitalists, for the most part, are considered primary care. So that's a plus. Many times are just a specialist. So you'll be in the category of a specialist instead of primary care. And some state may restrict the number of specialists to five. We will only accept five special petitions or, or, or 10, but uh, it depends on the state. So when you know the state 
you're going to be practicing or, or that you have been offered a job, the first thing you want to go is to check the guidelines for the J-1 waiver to better underst understand what the requirements are and what you're going to be subject to, whether limitations because you are a subspecialty or if you need more of that or less of this. Because the states have to meet the minimum federal requirements from the Department of State, but from there, they deviate a little bit. These are the programs uh, that we were able to confirm. They still see there's a lot of states that they still have J-1 waiver slats. Um, the ones we have question marks is because we were not able to confirm whether they have slats or if they have how many, so we're not sure about that. But if you see, there's a lot of um, states here that they still have <clears throat> waiver available. So you're in a good um, place there. Then you have another option, <coughs> I'm sorry, is the ARC waiver. This is a federal program and is only for a specific region. It covers all West Virginia. So that's a good, if you're looking in Virginia, you will probably be able to get your waiver here if Virginia doesn't have any more slats available. Um, in parts of Alabama, and you can see the, the, the states there. Where, why parts? Because it's not the entire state and it's only certain portions and usually they go by counties. So certain counties in Alabama, Georgia, Kentucky, Tennessee, Pennsylvania, all of those listed, the ones in red, what you're gonna see is that as we go to the DRA and the SCRC, they have states in common. So different states, a few of these states, you might have more than one option. You might have the State 30 Conrad, you might have the ARC, you might have the HHS because that's for the 50 states. The HHS is for every single state, but only for primary care. So some of these states, you might be able to have more than one choice. Okay, so great options when the states are kind of sharing different programs. Unlimited number of waivers, they can grant as many waivers as they want. That's always a good choice. Primary and subspecialties, but subspecialties usually have to prove the need. Doc, uh, employers have to prove the need of the subspecialty in the area. This program has Oh, Angela, we lost your audio. Sorry. Okay, good. Good. So this program has a $250,000 liquidated damages that has to be included in the agreement. And that's what the program requires. Uh, it, it's kind of a deterrent, but uh, that's what the um, program requires. Also, it requires uh, recruitment. And extensive is because employers have to do kind of a national estate and other kind of recruitment uh, and have to provide evidence that the recruitment was done before filing, before filing or and sometimes signing the contract for, with the physician. Uh, but unlimited number of waivers. So in events, and we've done this before, for example, if your employer says, well, we'll meet all of these, but we haven't done much recruitment, uh, we help the employer to engage in a campaign of recruitment for a couple months and then they can file the waivers. Unli unlimited means you can file your waiver at any time. Uh, then you have the DRA, Delta Regional Authority. Uh, this one also includes certain uh, states. And if you see, we have the states in red, common states with the ARC. Uh, there's no complete state and again, counties. So not just because you say Alabama, Alabama, it means it's not, uh, eligible for a DRA, it might not be. So you need to know specifically what the area is. Again, unlimited number of waivers. It also has the 250,000 liquidated damages, but that one might be waived. There's actually a form that says waiver that is signed by the employee and the employer, and you're waiving the, the liquidated damages extensive recruitments at least 45 days before filing the waiver, and it has a $3,000 processing fee. The 
SCRC, this is the newest program. It started last year in July. Uh, in, in general, it's been pretty good. They process waivers in about 45 days. They have a stay on task, and, and we have been able to see that those are, are being processed within that time, $3,000 processing fee, unlimited waivers, primary and subspecialties. Subspecialties most show the need for the specialty in the area. The good news about this program, which I love, uh, and I we've done one of those already, is that the region covers all of Florida, meaning the entire state of Florida. So if you want to live in Florida, because Florida State 30 Conrad already closed. They don't have any more waivers for this year, but you have the the SCRC and you could sponsor, you could have your waiver done in Florida because they do primary and subspecialty as long as the need for the subspecialty is proven. 3,000 processing fee and limited uh, number of waivers, and they have been pretty good in terms of processing it within 45 days. So if you file this waiver within the next few weeks, chances are you're going to be able to complete your process before June, July, when you graduate, get your H-1B and stay in the United States. Then we have the HHS, Department of Health and Human Services. This program is great. Um, but it's only for primary care physicians. It does not accept waivers for subspecialties, only for hospitalists that for some states is considered a specialty, but for hospitalists, then the physician is supposed to start working immediately after they complete the residency program um, in no more than a year of one specialty. So careful there. Um, uh, Non-compete clauses, that's pretty common with all the other waivers. That's kind of a federal Department of State requirement. So contracts cannot have non-compete clauses, and the contracts have to be for three years, and we've already talked to, about that. It requires proof of recruitment. That's another change they made recently. You used to be extensive recruitment. Now, as long as you have some proof that the employer tried to recruit for the position, that will meet the requirement. Again, the healthcare, uh, the health professional shortage area where you will work has to have a minimum score of seven. And it could be private, small, medium, large employer. It could be a public uh, entity, a nonprofit, for-profit, it doesn't matter. Any employer, as long as they are in a HIPSA score seven where you will be working. Uh, we are including the website. so. If and eventually we'll make the presentation available so you can go and Google or check this program's requirements. VA hospitals, obviously, Department of Veterans Affairs, you need a VA hospital to sponsor your waiver. The difficulty here is finding a VA hospital to sponsor a waiver. The, the, the VA, they do their own waivers. I have helped a few uh, VAs only with the H-1B visas, but not with the waiver. They do their own waivers. They process as many waivers as they want to, specialty, primary care, anything they want to sponsor. Uh, they, Because they are a federal agency, they can only offer a contract for a year and it's an offer of employment for a year, although um, the waiver in the H-1B will read for free. Uh, and the Department of Immigration Understanding accepts this because the VA cannot offer employment contracts for longer than a year. Uh, uh, super specialties are okay, no fee. They process their own waivers. The key here is finding a VA hospital to sponsor the waiver and also that you want to go work in a VA hospital for three years. We did a chart here where we kind of put together all the different programs. If you see Conrad 30, 30 SLAS, ARC, DRAC, SCRC, VA, HHS, all of them are unlimited. So you have unlimited options here. The problem is that they, the options you have may not be in the state that you desire, but you still have a lot of options to get your waivers and you still have a few states where you can still do your Conrad 30. Um, all of them, Three-year contract, some of them require four years or plus. Uh, HIPSA, MUAs, FLEX, that's a requirement unless you're a FLEX, and then you're going to have to serve the population that live in the underserved areas. Um, processing fees in the Conrad 30, some 
states have a fee, others, most of them don't have a processing fee. Uh, recruitment state by state, some, some states require recruitment, others don't. Uh, the liquidated damages, we already talked about that. Uh, and, and for the most part, um, they all accept subspecialties. You might have to prove the need for the specific subspecialty in the area where the job is being offered. We have been working with several uh, uh, providers and colleagues, and one of them is diagnostics. Um, they have, uh, they are exclusively, or they exclusively work with physicians to help them with contracts, and they gave us these great tips. And, and we thought it was, this was helpful because in the process of finding that employer, you will need to sign your employment contract. And yes, there are certain provisions that are non-negotiable because that's required by the J-1 waiver, by the H-1B, federal agencies, but there are others that are negotiable. Uh, and what we want you is to have information to have a good contract. Uh, uh, they always advise know your worth, meaning uh, how much is that you are worth in the market. Understand everything in the agreement and ask whatever you don't understand, ask, ask, and ask. But that's for everything in life. Whatever you don't understand, ask the questions. And if you need help, you can always go to people like diagnostics and get help with your uh, employment agreement. Understand the challenges and the risk by signing the agreement. Um, there are a lot, but when it comes to J-1 waiver, you if you want your waiver, you have to sign that agreement for three years. One of the uh, challenges is that for J-1 waiver physicians, you sign that agreement for three years and you cannot change employers during the three years unless you're able to demonstrate extenuating circumstances. So you, we want you to make sure you know where you're going um, and you're gonna be in a place that you can leave for at least three years. Um, no red flags and clarify questions. You always want to have these points in mind when you're negotiating your contract. Here is their information, uh, contact diagnostics. You can contact them at any time. Uh, they're pretty good to turn around and they'll be able to help you with any questions. We only review agreements for immigration purposes. For other purposes, you may go to the professionals that can help you with that. So you're running out of time uh, to file your waiver. We have this fun little mnemonic. You wanna make sure you've covered your four J's, right? So if you still need to take your boards, you can file for the J-1 visa extension. Uh, it only applies to file for to in these situations when you finish your program for the boards. So if that still needs to happen, you can seek your extension. Obviously, we've gone over uh, multiple programs. Look to see which ones are open and target those that still have availability. Um, there's quite a few states you saw on that list that are available. And then with the introduction of the new program, the SCRC, um, that one's a huge advantage that we've seen that's been benefiting a lot of foreign physicians. Um, also, the J-1 waiver filing. File that TS 3035. You want to file that 612 as soon as you can. If you can hit any of those requirements to file a J1 waiver, because you know you're going to be going through this waiver process, you want to file that as soon as possible. Um, and then remember the J1 waiver process. Say you start it, but for some reason you can't extend your time. Your waiver of the two year home uh, two year home residency requirement can continue if you started it, even if you have to depart. So let's say you have to go back for some time, you have to go out of the country, and the waiver eventually gets approved. Just like with everything else, you go for visa processing, and you'll come in. You will not have had to sit out for the two years, hopefully, because of the processing. It won't be that long, and you've already taken care of that impediment, that legal impediment. So, um, what do we have? There's O options. The O visa for the change of status from J to O is an attractive option if you have it available to you as an option. You actually can go to the consulate and get your O visa. Now, oftentimes people, once they get here, they want to just go ahead and file a change of status. I want to change from J to O. I'm permitted. If you're switching to the O, you have to consular process. You have to go out and, and go get the visa. Of course, stateside, or even if you're not here, the I-129 would be the petition that's filed by the employer. Once it's approved, 
that's when you can go and get the visa stamp for the O. Um, you don't have to complete the two-year home residency requirement to come in on the O. Um, but then the requirements of the O are pretty strict, right? You have to be a physician who's risen to the top of your field. There's multiple criteria, and we've done multiple presentations on the O1 for physicians. So I would encourage you to go to um, to our uh, YouTube page and find those who we can, you can go over all the requirements. They haven't really changed, but the fact is you do need an employer. Um, there's a one to three year validity period, depending on what's contained in that petition. Um, you can extend indefinitely. We've seen that on multiple occasions. And you can go from employer to employer in O status. Again, it doesn't dispel that two year home residency requirement. If you ever wanted to get your green card, you're going to have to still deal with that. But this O is sort of that option to kind of bridge you in between processes or if you're still trying to get that waiver secured and you have a way to continue working with a particular employer. Um, and then, okay, so then the, the H-1B visa. Um, once the J-1 waiver is approved, you're working in H-1B status with the sponsoring employer. Um, a lot of physicians will get confused or they, they see the J and the H thrown around and they understand, well, I can just switch to H. Well, no, once you're, the waiver is approved and you're allowed to be in the United States pursuant to that approved waiver, you're serving that time of the waiver process in H-1B status. So you may be a J-1 physician whose waiver is approved and you're serving that time in H-1B status. It's always important to make sure that you are in H-1B status to complete that time. Um, there's no J-1 waiver physicians for um, the H-1B cap physician. So if you've completed your residency program um, or fellowship with the H-1B, there's no J-1. So um, again, though, if you are a J-1 who's gone home for the two-year home uh, residency requirement, you've completed that, um, you could be an H-1B cap position if you were going with a non, with a cap, a non-cap exempt employer. So, um, and that also applies again to J-1 physicians who have obtained their hardship waiver, persecution waiver. You can always go to an H-1B cap employer. Um, but again, that that's really not the case with physicians because a lot of physicians that we have are are working for cap exempt employers but don't completely discard or uh, disregard the option of working for a cap subject employer and then oh this is a fun one canadian j1 physicians canadians get to enjoy no visa right so there's no visa for a lot so how does um this waiver come about and and Angela probably has a more eloquent way of explaining it because um, Canadians are our northern our friends north of the border. Um, it's just different how they process. Yes. Um, if you recall, for some of you who are familiar with this, Canadian citizens do not need a visa to enter the United States. They just show their passport at the port of entry, whether it's through the border or or the airport. Uh, and the passport, I'm Canadian, and they let them in. If it is a visitor, they give them a, a waiver, a visitor visa, which is a waiver kind of for 30, 90 days. They come, visit, they leave, they come and go anytime. Same for employment-based visas, because they don't have to go to the consulate as the most of the rest of the world, that we have to go to consulates, apply for a visa, uh, they get the visa stamp and the passport, and enter. They don't. They just present the approval, if the approval has to be done through the Department of Immigration, which most of the time has to be done, like the H-1B visa, Michelle explained, you file the petition for, with the Department of Immigration, they approve it, not for change of status. Change of status is, I'm hearing this status, give me an H-1B in the United States. You cannot do that because immediately they'll ask for your waiver. But if you get the uh, H-1B file and you say, no, I'll go, I'll go to the consulate and apply, even though Canadians don't have to go to the consulate, they get that approval and that they way back to the United States, they show the H-1B approval with their passport and they are admitted in H-1B visa. We do this frequently for Canadian physicians who are not able to get that sponsorship for a waiver and they run out of time, but they find an employer that is cap exempt. Remember, if the only people who are exempt are the J-1 waiver physicians. You got your waiver, you're exempt. But if you don't have a waiver, then you're going to be as a, a subject to the cap. So if you find an employer that is exempt from the cap, example, nonprofit hospital that teaches students, then that hospital can sponsor you. So if you're from Canada, you go get your visa, you come back, come back, you start working with them, and then 
later on you can apply for your J1 waiver. Just so you know, that's an option and it's done very frequently. Great, so that run, that's, that's our presentation. Hopefully you got all the information you needed. We do have a few questions in the queue. Uh, let me start with those. And then if you have other questions, we can go to your questions. A uh, couple of those questions is, uh, what does that mean, group practice, if you are in an underserved area? But if you're not in an underserved area um, and you still can do the waiver, and I understand that to be, yes, we're talking about the flex waiver, which is if the practice where the physician or location is going to work, it's not in an underserved area, but the population that is served comes from the underserved areas that surround the practice. Of course, the employer has to prove what is the percentage, what is the area, where they come from, so then that employer may still qualify for a J-1 waiver if can prove that the population they serve comes, and it ha doesn't have to be 100%, but it has to be significant enough to, to need a physician uh, to cover the need for medical services, although the location may not be designated. How can we find which state have openings? You need to go to every specific state like we do. This time of the year, every time we're gonna do a waiver, we, the first thing we do is we contact the agency, whatever state that might be, and we ask them, do you still have slots uh, available and how many? So we know how soon we have to wait, file, the, file the waiver. Some states, they're pretty good about updating their website. So if you go, for example, Texas, J1 waiver, uh, process and you go in, they'll tell you right now it sh shows closed. We don't have any more waivers. But other states don't update their website, but they have emails. Uh, so you contact them and ask them, hey, do you still have waivers? And that's how we do it state by state. Yeah, uh, I left a couple of voicemails today because it's just not published. They'll have the contact information, the extension, and I will tell you oftentimes they don't pick up. So you'll want to put the call in. Yes, yes. Uh, there's also groups on, online, Facebook and, and YouTube, and they talk about physicians. One of the things that we love about working with physicians and J1 Weaver is that you guys are very well educated and knowledgeable, and you know how to research for information. And sometimes, believe me, I'm on, we're on consultations with, with these physicians, and they give us some information that we may not be aware of because it's so new or information that we're just getting and are reviewing and they are already looking into. So physicians are very good in sharing information. So they might share information about, oh, well, I couldn't apply for this waiver on this state because they run out of waivers. So that's how you find out what waivers are available. Is the SCRC is still not-for-profit hospital? SCRC is a new program and they, they are open to all employers, any employer, as long as they meet the qualification standard, meaning if the location is in an underserved area, uh, whether it's a HIPSA or MUA, the location has to be underserved and, and be within the state or the regions, like the entire state of Florida or the other states in the region. Only employers within that region in underserved areas that meet those minimum requirements can sponsor waivers. So it's not about profit or not for profit. It doesn't matter. Uh, liquidated damages. Can you explain liquidated damages? Um, liquidated damages is uh, a provision that has to be uh, included in the Agreement and by, basically it says if the physician ends the contract before the three years are up, the physician has to be has to pay two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to the employer for damages. That's what a liquidated damages is. They they are already anticipating you leave. You got to pay the employer who is going to go through all this trouble to sponsor you for your waiver two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Remember the DRA allows for the liquidated damages to be uh, waived which is a good thing. I don't know what is ARC is waiting for to have the same wa waiver. Um, so those are the questions we have here. If anybody has any other questions, please, um, we're open for questions.
Michelle, did, did you get any questions on, in the email that went out this afternoon or we don't have any more questions? I do, I did get a, one question this afternoon and it was about J1 physician who is asking me about the J2 dependent. He's, he's married and his spouse has a J2. So understand that anything that go, happens to the J1 physician will happen to the J2. So if the J1 physician obtains the waiver, the J2 obtains a waiver. The difference is that the J2 dependent don't have to work in an underserved area for three years, but the principal physician, yes. I think there's one. The the only question I had, and it was one that you and I discussed off, was um, regarding uh, hardship, and 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 we touched on uh, regarding in the in the presentation. But I would just emphasize, um, it's got to be documented hardship. So um, you can't just provide a statement that says, oh. Um, this is a situation and we've had to go back and forth with a few physicians and say, can we get that in writing? Like who, who can give that? Because uh, USAS will ask for evidence. They will not take your statement um, just on its face value. So we like uh, to present supported packets of evidence. So while you may have the, the hardship very much there, it's really more the practice of putting together the, the packet to substantiate that in documentary form. Great. Okay, well, thank you so much for your attendance. We hope this uh, presentation was informative and that you can get as much as you can. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. We'll be happy to talk to you. Thank you again. There is our information. Contact us and we'll see you soon.